On this example, we want to use the graph of the known basic function and a combination of the horizontal and vertical shifts to sketch the graph of the function. The function we're interested in is h of x equals square root of x plus 1 plus 6. Now we're going to start with the graph of the known basic function. So looking at our equation, h of x equals the square root of x plus 1 plus 6, we know that the basic function is going to use this square root. So y equals square root x is our basic function. And we're going to take a look at the graph of this basic function before we get started on sketching this graph with the transformations. So I'm going to start by choosing some values of x. And the values that I choose for x are going to be very specific to this square root equation. I know that I can only take this square root of positive values, so I'm only going to choose positive x values. And I want my uh, numbers to come out very nice and easy for me to graph on this grid on the right. So I don't want to get any crazy decimal answers. So for that reason, I'm going to choose values of x that are going to work out to be nice square roots. And that means I'm going to pick perfect squares. So I'm going to pick 0 and 1 because they're perfect squares. And then um, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and 4 squared is 16. So I pick those values so that when I work out this math, my numbers, my ordered pairs, are going to be really nice. So then for my y values, I have square root of 0, which is 0, square root of 1, which is 1, square root of 4 is 2, square root of 9 is 3, and square root of 16 is 4. So this gives me ordered pairs of 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3, and 16, 4. So I'm going to plot these points on the right, the coordinate plane on the right. I have 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3, and this will be 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 and 4. So we get a curve that looks like this. So this picture can be a little bit hard to graph because it comes to the stopping point right here at 0, 0. It does not continue beyond there. And I typically remember this picture um, by it being the top half of a sideways parabola. So if you think of it that way, you can remember what the graph looks like. So this is going to help us to graph the function with transformations h of x equals square root of x plus 1 plus 16. So we've already identified that the base function is the square root of x. And let's write down what our function is here so I have it. That's h of x equals square root of x plus 1 plus 6. So we need to work out what transformations are going on here. In the directions it mentioned that we have horizontal and vertical shifts. So I have a table over here of horizontal and vertical shifts for us to identify what's going on. So we know that we have a shift whenever we have adding or subtracting in the equation. If that adding or subtracting is outside, we know that it's a vertical shift. If it is inside, it is a horizontal shift. And when I say inside and outside, that means inside of your base function, inside of the radical, or outside of the radical. And then if you're adding, you're going to shift up. If you're subtracting, you're going to shift down. If you're on the inside of the radical and you're adding, you're going to go left. If 
you're on the inside of the radical and you're subtracting, you're going to go right. So this helps guide us as to what we're going to do with our transformations here. We have a plus 1 and a plus 6. The plus 1 is on the inside of the radical. So I know that this is going to be a horizontal shift. And because it's plus, I'm going to shift to the left. And then the plus 6 is on the outside, making it a vertical shift. And because it's plus, I'm going to shift up. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that graph that we drew a little bit earlier. And we're going to shift it to the left 1 and up 6. Go to the left so starting at 0, 0, I'm going to the left 1 and up 6. And my graph will look something like this. So it's the same graph that we had before, but shifted to a different position on our plane. In this question, we want to use the graph of the known basic function and a combination of horizontal and vertical shifts to sketch the function. The function we'd like to sketch is g of x equals absolute value of x minus 4 plus 4. So we want to start with the graph of a known basic function. And within our equation, within the function that we're trying to graph, is a clue as to which of the basic functions we would like to use. So you can see that this has absolute value bars, and that means that our basic function is y equals absolute value of x. So we're going to start by drawing a quick sketch of y equals absolute value of x, and I'm going to use uh, sort of a standard set of ordered pairs, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. I'll substitute those into the absolute value of x. Absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. Absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1. Absolute value of 0 is 0. Absolute value of 1 is 1. Absolute value of 2 is 2. And that gives me ordered pairs of negative 2, 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 2. So with these ordered pairs, I'm going to get a, a nice sketch for this graph. So I have negative 2, 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 2. And this graph for the absolute value turns out to be a V-shaped graph. So we're going to start with this graph and then complete the transformations that we have to arrive at the graph of absolute value of x minus 4 plus 4. Let's write that function down here. g of x is equal to absolute value of x minus 4 plus 4. Our basic function we've already mentioned is absolute value of x. We know the graph of that basic function is a V-shaped graph. And with this, we have two transformations. We have the transformation of minus 4 that's on the inside of the absolute value and plus 4 that's on the outside. Now, whenever we have adding and subtracting, to our basic function, we're going to get the transformation of a shift. So both of these are shifts. When you're adding or subtracting is on the inside of your base, in this case our base is absolute value, so that minus 4 is on the inside of absolute value, we get a horizontal shift. And that plus 4, that plus 4 is outside of the absolute value, and that's a vertical shift. 
Now, because we have a minus 4, the minus tells us this is going to shift to the right. We're going to go right 4 units. And the plus 4, because it's a plus, we're going to go up 4 units. So we start with that graph of absolute value that we had earlier. Starting at 0, 0. 0, 0 is where that um, comes to a V. And we're going to move that to the right 4 and then up 4 and draw the V at that point. So this gives us a sketch of the graph of absolute value of x minus 4 plus 4. From this question, we want to use the graph of the known basic function and a combination of horizontal shifts, reflections, and vertical shifts to sketch the function. The function we're working with is g of x equals negative x squared minus 3. So we want to start by graphing the known basic function. And within our equation, we have the clue of the squared telling us which basic function we need to graph. So we need to graph y equals x squared. We're going to choose a standard set of x values, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We'll substitute that into x squared. Get negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1. 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. And 2 squared is 4. This gives us the ordered pairs negative 2, 4 negative 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1, and finally 2, 4. If I plot these ordered pairs on my grid, I get negative 2, 4, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4, and we get a shape that looks like a U that we call a parabola. We know that this is going to be the shape of our graph g of x equals negative x squared minus 3. We just need to work out the transformations before we know exactly where it is on the grid. Let's write our function down here. g of x equals negative x squared minus 3. We already know that the basic function is y equals x squared and that has the graph of the parabola. We do have two transformations, this negative that's multiplied and this minus 3. We have a negative and a minus 3. Now the negative is being multiplied and whenever a negative is multiplied we have a transformation of reflection. Now that negative is outside of our base. Our base is the square. That negative is outside of the square, so that makes this a vertical reflection. And a vertical reflection will mirror over the x-axis. So anything above the x-axis will get reflected or mirrored below. Anything below will get reflected and mirrored above. This minus 3 is going to be in the category of shifts. The transformation of shifts happens when you add or subtract, and this is a minus 3, so that's a subtraction. That minus is outside of the square, making a vertical transformation. And because we have a minus, it's going to reflect down, excuse me, not reflect, shift down by 3. So I'm going to take um, the point zero, 0, and I'm going to shift it down 3. And that takes care of the second transformation. But for the reflection, instead of my parabola, having that U shape, it's going to be sort of like a hill or an upside down U. 
So this is going to give us a sketch of the graph of g of x equals negative x squared minus 3. In this question, we want to use the graph to evaluate each expression or state that it is undefined. We have two pictures. We have a picture of a parabola, which is labeled as y equals f of x. And we have a linear graph, which is labeled as y equals g of x. And in part A, we'd like to find f plus g of 2. So I'm going to start by rewriting this in a slightly different form. f plus g of 2 is the same thing as f of 2 plus g of 2. We know that because this plus means that we're going to add the two functions together. So I need to take a look at an x value of 2. This notation, f of 2, is describing the x to be 2. And f of 2 is going to be the y value, and g of 2 is a y value. So I'm going to go to where x equals 2, and this vertical line are all the ordered pairs that have x equals 2. If we look on the graph of g, that's a linear, that's a y value of 1. And if we look on the graph of f, that's a y value of 4. So f of 2 is 4, and g of 2 is 1. We'll add those together to get 5. So let's move on to part B. I'm going to erase my markings because this is a different question. And we want to find f minus g of 1. So that's the same thing as f of 1 minus g of 1. 1 is the x value. So here's an x value of 1. All of the ordered pairs that have an x value of 1 are on that red line. If we take a look at where that crosses, f, that has a y value of 1, and where it crosses, g, that has a y value of 2. So f of 1 is 1, g of 1 is 2, and 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Now let's find f times g of 0. That's the same thing as f of 0 times g of 0. 0 is our x value. x value of 0 will be right on top of the y-axis. I'm looking where that intersects the graph of f, and that's right here with a y value of 0, and where that line crosses g, and that is at a y value of 3. So f of 0 is 0, g of 0 is 3, and 0 times 3 is 0. So finally, let's do part d. In part d, I want to find f over g of 1. That's f of 1 over g of 1. And 1 is our x value. And I want to look where f has got an x value of 0. That's right here at this spot. And that y value is 1. I think I misspoke there. Um, we have an x value of 1, and the y value is 1. And for g, our x value is 1, and the y value is 2. So f of 1 is 1, g of 1 is 2, 
1 divided by 2 is 1 half. So f over g of 1 is 1 half. Given that f of x is equal to negative 20 over x plus 1, and g of x is equal to the square root of x plus 22, find f composed with g of negative 6. I know this is a little bit fuzzy, but that's an open circle. And so it really reads like this. f composed of f composed with g of negative 6. So what this um, operation means is substituting one function inside of another function. So f compose with g of negative 6 means that you want to substitute g into a function called f and also substitute negative 6 into g. So this, this, these symbols kind of give us exact instructions on what to do. So if we look inside here, g of negative 6 um, tells us to evaluate the function g with the value of negative 6. So I'm going to work that out. And that is the square root of negative 6 plus 22. And that is the square root of 16. And the square root of 16 is 4. So we worked out that inside portion. And now we are going to work out this whole thing here. F of 4 says to evaluate, evaluate the function f at the value of 4. So in place of that x, I'm going to substitute 4. That's negative 20 over 4 plus 1, negative 20 over 5, and 20 over 5 is 4. And so we get negative 4 for our solution. So f Compose with g of negative 6 is negative 4. For this question, we want to evaluate the logarithm without the use of a calculator. The logarithm we have is log base 2 of 64. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this logarithmic expression in terms of an exponential. Logs and exponentials are inverse operations of each other. And I've been using exponentials a whole lot longer than I've been using logs. So it's a little bit easier for me to think when an expression is in exponential form rather than log form. So we have a definition that relates logarithms to exponentials. And that definition looks something like this. If you have y equals log base b of x, this is equivalent to an exponential of this form here. b to the y equals x. So this gives us a way to take any log equation and write it as an exponential equation. Now, we don't have a log equation. We have a log expression because we don't have an equals. So I'm going to say that this equals some p. And I use p for power. Power is what we sometimes call an exponent. So now that I have an equation, I'm going to rewrite this. Following this pattern here, we have the base of the log is the base of the exponent. We have the base of our log being 2, so that's going to be the base of our exponent, 2. The log always equals the exponent, so our log equals y. You can see that's in the exponent. So our log equals p, p for power. 
and then our exponential expression is going to equal what's inside the log. So you can see over here, inside the log is what the exponential expression equals. So now we have this written in exponential form. 2, 2 to some power equals 64. So then I just have to figure out what that power is. So I know that 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, 2 to the 4th is 16, 2 to the 5th is 32, 2 to the 6th, that is 64. And so I know that 2 to the 6th power is 64, and that 6 is in place of where p is. So I can say that log base 2 of 64 is 6. And that's one way we can evaluate a logarithm without using a calculator. Sketch the logarithmic function. Label three points that lie on the graph and determine the domain of the equation. Um, determine the domain and the equation of any vertical asymptotes. And we'd like to sketch the function h of x equals log base 8 of x. So logarithmic functions are related to exponential functions. They're actually inverse operations of each other. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to find the ordered pairs in exponential form since it's much easier for me to do the calculations in that form. So what I'm going to do is I'll rewrite this equation. h of x equals log base 8 of x. So first I'm going to write it as y equals log base 8 of x. And then I'm going to write this as an exponential. Um, as an exponential, we would use the base 8, y as the power, and that expression would equal x. And this goes back to the definition of the logarithmic function. And I'm going to find ordered pairs. And I usually will choose x's and find y's. But because of the way that I have this equation written, I have x equals 8 to the y. I'm instead going to choose y values and solve to find the x values. So for my y values, I'm going to choose a standard set, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We'll substitute those into the um, equation. So that's going to be 8 to the negative 2, which is 1 over 8 squared. That's 1 over 64. 8 to the negative 1, that's 1 over 8. 8 to the 0 is 1. 8 to the first is 8. And 8 to the second is 64. So this gives me a set of ordered pairs. My x is 1 64th and my y is negative 2. My x is negative 1. Oh, I've got that backwards. My x is 1 8th. And my y is negative 1. My x is 1. My y is 0. My x is 8, my y is 1, my x is 64, and my y is 2. So this gives me that set of ordered pairs, 1 64th and negative 2. 1 64th is really close to 0. 1 8th and negative 1. 1 8th is really close to 0 as well, but not quite as close as 1 64th. And we have 1, 0, and 8, 1. And way off the chart over here, I would have my 64 and 2.
So if we're sketching this graph, we get something that looks like this. And this one is going to get closer and closer and closer to that y-axis without ever reaching it. So that means that right along this y-axis, we have a vertical asymptote. So vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So that covers the equation of the vertical asymptote. And then we want to determine the domain. You can see from the picture that my, my x values start once we cross the y-axis. So that's when your uh, domain will start. It'll start at 0 and go to infinity. So this is the domain from 0 to infinity. So we've got a sketch of the graph, the domain of 0 to infinity, and a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Well, in this example, we want to find the domain of the logarithmic function f of x equals log base 1 fourth of 1 minus, excuse me, negative 1 minus 5x. So if we're looking for the domain of a log, what we need to know is that log is only defined for positive values. So log of positive is defined log of a negative is undefined, and log of 0 is undefined. So if we want to find the domain of a log function, what's inside the log must be positive. So that, that value must be positive. So we're going to take the expression inside the log, negative 1 minus 5x, and we want that to be positive, which is greater than 0. And we're going to solve that log inequality, solve that inequality to find the domain. So I'm going to add 1 to both sides. It's negative 5x is greater than 1. I'll divide by negative 5 on both sides, and that gives x. I reverse the inequality sign. x is less than negative 1 fifth. So I can write this in interval notation. Um, if I think my number line, negative 1 fifth, is on the number line, I'm going to use an open circle and shade to the left. I'm going to have negative infinity to negative 1 fifth. Use a parenthesis on the negative 1 fifth to not include that in the set. So the domain is negative infinity to negative 1 fifth. In this example, we want to use the product rule to expand the logarithmic expression and whenever possible, evaluate the logarithmic expressions. The expression we're working with is log base 7 of 343 times x. So let's start by stating what the product rule is. So the product rule for logarithms allows us to take an expression, log base b, of m times n and expand it into log base b of m plus log base b of n. So it's given the name of the product rule because you need to have a product inside your logarithm. For the expression that we have, we have log base 7 of 343x, which is 343 times x. So we do have a product inside of our logarithm. So we can use the product rule to expand this into log base 7 of 343 plus log base 7 of x. And we're given these directions over here to evaluate whenever possible. And any time we have a number inside of our log, you want to try to simplify that log expression. So to think about simplifying or evaluating this logarithm, 
you have a base of 7, and you want to think about what power do you need to raise 7 to to get the expression that's inside your log, 343. 7 to what power is 343? And I believe that's the third power, but let me just double check. Um, so 7 squared we know is 49, 7 cubed, so let me do 49 times 7, that's 63, and that's 7 times 4 is 28, uh, plus 6 would be 34. So yes, yeah, 7 to the third would be 343. So I know that this log expression is going to equal that 3. The log is equal to the exponent, the power. So we were able to simplify this log expression to be 3 plus log base 7 of x. Thank you for checking out my videos. Have a great day.